Hey there, it's time to build a new furnace. This time I got fire brick. Here's the old furnace. Uh, you might recognize this as the general Grant Thompson uh, mini metal foundry design. Uh, when I built it, I did the plaster of Paris and sand and that died immediately. Died right away. Replaced it with this castable refractory cement from Menards and it's holding up pretty good and it's still solid. It works, but it's pretty thin and it doesn't insulate at all and this is really small inside. So we're pitching this. <laughs> Not gonna throw it because it's too heavy. And we're replacing it with this. A bunch of insulating fire brick. I bought a whole bunch of these. First, quick word on fire brick. There are many kinds of fire brick. You might have heard uh, there's the heavy fire brick and the light fire brick. This is light fire brick. There's many kinds of light fire brick. Uh, see this number right here, 28? That means this is a 2800 degree fire brick. Uh, the, most of them that you see when they just say insulating fire brick and they don't tell you, it's probably a 2300 degree fire brick. 2300, obviously, a lot less than 2800. Same goes for uh, ceramic wool. You hear kale wool. There's different kinds of kale wool. It's not just one thing. And there's different temperature ratings. And the temperature ratings are not as high as you might think. You know, if you go, if this is 2800. If I try to heat this thing up to 4000, the brick's going to melt. So, yeah, those, those ratings really matter. And I'm not going to get the temperature of the furnace up above 2800, but I'm going to be blasting a propane flame into there. And if the propane flame heats the surface of one of these bricks up above 2800, which it will, uh, that can damage the fire brick. So, Fire brick, ceramic wool, cast wool refractory. They all have temperature ratings. You must pay attention to that. The price, you might have guessed, goes up with the temperature. So you can get them up to 3200 easy. Uh, I'll, I'll put a link of where I got this. It's like a cremation place, which is a little bit creepy. Uh, pretty sure these aren't going to be haunted, though, so we're going to be all right. So we're going to get around that problem later with a coating. But for right now, we're going to have to cut these up into a shape. You may notice that this is brick-shaped. And a furnace, the one I had earlier, is cylinder shaped. So what we're going to do with this is we're going to take this and a bunch of other ones and kind of taper the sides in a little bit. That'll allow us to kind of line them all up in a nice circle without having big gaps. What we're not looking for is this kind of a big gap because then right here there's no insulation happening there. However, if I chop it all the way back so it's sealed up to here, and like this, then the inside is going to be tiny and we use a lot of fire brick. So I'm going to split the difference, start the cut halfway, and go out. That way they'll sort of overlap, there'll be a decent amount of insulation in the corners, and we'll worry about the gaps later. Let future me figure that part out. Now to do this, I created a nice little template. And basically how I did this is that I determined this is four and a half inches wide, I want a certain size furnace, uh, nine bricks will do it. So you can do a, a cool geometry thing, look up angles of a whatever. It's called a nonagon, nine, nine angled, nine sided, whatever. And in a nonagon, this angle here will be 40 degrees. 40 degrees in all of those. Split the difference because we're going to shave each side. Each of these must be shaved off at 20 degree angles. And that's what this is. A nice little template. It's big for, you'll see why later. Uh, in fact, I'm not even going to use this. You'll see, you'll see that whole thing later. Forget I showed you. I, did, I didn't show you. What was that? I don't know. I'm basically just going to mark this up where I want it. Now one thing you'll notice if you try using insulated fire brick and you're, you're writing on it, it is very crumbly. It is quite soft. Some people call it uh, soft brick or light insulating fire brick as opposed to the heavy stuff. Everything is relative. So when you hear light insulating fire brick versus heavy non-insulating fire brick, remember the light one, the light one, is light relative to a freaking brick. It's very heavy. This package came when I was at work and my wife decided to move it inside the garage. Uh, her spine hurt for the rest of the weekend. Of course I can't talk because I just moved my car in and out of the garage by pushing it. And that's always a recipe for fun. My back hurts right now. I was pushing kinda hard and then I realized, oh, the emergency brake's on. Awesome. Another nifty thing about insulating fire brick is that it's good and soft. Soft enough to cut with a saw. Try to use a saw you don't care about. That's my tip. Uh, this may seem soft and it's crumbly, but I'm pretty sure the powder is still highly abrasive. I know that because this saw used to say husky on it. Sanded it right off. So yeah, probably pretty abrasive. Also, you don't want to breathe it, so respirator is your friend. 
Boom! See how nice and easy that is? And how crummy a cut I just did? So this is obviously an uneven cut, as would happen if you used a Home Depot saw on a plank of wood. But I have this. This resolves the problem. This handy little device was uh, like a microplane or something that clips into a handle and it was a, a wood rasp. Anyway, the flat one is garbage for the kind of woodworking I was using, but I found out that this works pretty well in insulating fire brick. And it shaves it down quite smoothly, which can kind of help align your cut with the lines that you drew. A good tip is to leave more material, because you can shave it off, but you can't stick it back on real easy. I think I got this at Woodcraft like many years ago, but I've also seen them in uh, like cooking things. It's a lemon zester, and they're, they're really trying to market the crap out of this little cheese grate tool. Another benefit, the cut I did was kind of not real good like this, and this sort of acts like a plane to, to smooth that out, as if you were to use like a, a saw that had like a feed like a normal person who doesn't just have janky tools. There we go, see? A nice, clean, flat, smooth cut. I dare the Egyptians to do a better job. Actually, they did a much better job. Those pyramids are top quality. And before you go saying that it was aliens that helped, think about this. They made how many pyramids? Not three. Those are the three big ones. Like, hundreds of them. Out of, like, sandstone. You don't think, out of all those thousands and thousands of bricks, they could have figured out how to cut them so they fit? Pretty sure they got that covered. Now for the second brick. I'm going to use this to make a top piece. Uh, the top will be made out of, again, nine bricks in a circle. But this will take a little bit more work because they're like, do this instead of this. You understand those hand motions, right? Step one will be to mark this two and a half inches up. So what I'm doing here is I'm not going to make a base with a flat top like you see so much. I'm going to make a base and the top will go up and then go in. So it'll have like a cavity inside. And I'm doing that for multiple reasons, which I hope are not completely stupid, but we'll find out. I originally designed the lid to be kind of like, I don't know, one of those brick domes. But I'd have to cut one of these bricks into a million different ways and it all had to be very accurate. And that, that was never going to happen. Not a chance. So I simplified it. Probably the first time I've ever simplified something. I usually go the other direction. Okay, so you see this line all the way around? How do you think I'm going to do that nice and square? I don't have a chop saw. If you have a chop saw, use a chop saw. Of course, your blade might get screwed up, but eh, whatever. Greatness requires sacrifice. I'm going to take my crappy Home Depot saw and saw a slight line along the line. A very gentle. There. Yeah. So that's a line right where I want it. If I put the blade in that, it kind of slots in nice. See this? This is a piece of wood from an old, some kind of wood project that I never finished that ended up getting burned, but some of it didn't for some reason. But the edges are fair, are square. These are like 90 degree edges. So put that in there, slide that down like that. When this is slid up against the saw blade and saw blade is pushed up against that, now the saw blade is perfectly 90 degrees from the top. Give or take however crappy this is and however sloppy I'm holding it, which is probably quite a bit. But it's going to be a lot less bad than if I just freehanded this. Stop to double check. Eh, that's not real great, but that's fine. And now, cut the rest of the way. This is a pretty thick saw blade, so it's got some stiffness. So once you get in a little ways, it'll just kind of keep going the same way. There's a little ridge. Knock down the ridge. Another nice woodworking trick. Don't just do this. Go across also. That'll help knock down any high spots. It's kind of how you level a board with hand planes. Now, remember that piece of paper I showed you and promptly lost? Uh, here's how this works. I use the marks on the paper to mark up the, the brick. And this angle gives me exactly the angle that I want. So anyway, as I was saying about the Egyptians, you don't think they could have figured out making bricks fit after a few thousand of them? Here's an idea. You can't figure out how they fit them up top of the pyramid. Maybe at the bottom of the pyramid they had the two bricks in line to go up the ramp. They put them together and said, oh, shave it down here. Shave it down. Oh, no, oh, it's perfect. Send her up. And even then, you get to the top of the pyramid. You can send a dude up there with some tools. You know, it's sandstone. It's not that tough. Send a guy up, and if they line him up and say, oh, this, this one doesn't fit, you know, maybe we got to fix that. 
and he'll just fix it. You know, some people fix it, and then they'll put it back. It always amazes me how people think that other people in the past were somehow really, really stupid, like stupider than people now. Like, you see the internet, you see people now. Anyway, that's a tangent. This is not a pyramid we're building. That's a bad cut. That's what happens when you don't use the board as a guide. Ta-da! That part fixed. It's always good to have a, a template, even if your template's made out of paper. I even drew a line here. This is a different dimension for the whole. You'll, you'll see later. Spoilers. I'm telling you the ending of the story already. Boom! And this? Keep this. You know, it might, might be handy to have a triangle cheese wedge of the stuff. And another thing about those Egyptians and their pyramids. There are people with, like, the conspiracy theory that, oh, they're at this certain pitch angle and it's so important for reasons to do with astronomy and aliens. It's not. They're all at the same angle. Well, some of them are at the same angle. The later ones are pretty consistently angled, although not entirely. And if you see the earlier ones, they worked out the angle through trial and error. They had a bunch of them that they tried to make way too steep. And especially when stacking something like a brick, they're really heavy. So you got a brick, it's fine. You got another brick, it's fine. You got 50,000 bricks stacked up top. Well, this bottom brick is holding 50,000 bricks worth of force. It'll break. Whole thing will collapse. If you make them too steep, the bottom gets too much stress. And they made one pyramid, it's particularly telling of this, called the Bent Pyramid, where it's going up way too steep. They get part of the way up, and it starts to crack and stuff. So they say, uh-oh, this thing's going to collapse on us. So they went from steep to not so steep for the cap. And it looks really goofy, called the Bent Pyramid. Look it up. They figured it out. That angle is not something important in whatever. It's just the steepest you can make it reliably and go as tall as you want. And yeah, yeah, back to the sawing. I actually read a book series called The Giza Death Star. A guy theorized that the ancient Egyptians were in a war with Martians and people on the moon, and the Giza Pyramid is actually a death star, like a death laser that blew something up, and it makes no sense. And I kid you not, I kid you not, the way he justified it, he showed a cutaway of the Giza Pyramid, or like the vent and the chamber and whatever, next to a cutaway of the Death Star. Yes, Star Wars Death Star. There's this big staircase, and he's like, look, this is the amplification chamber, because it looks long, like the amplification chamber on the cutaway of the Death Star or something. And he even has a story about Napoleon and his men were in there, and one of them decided to fire a gunshot, and lo and behold, it was really loud, so it must have amplified it. Well, he's in a stone room, it's really loud! Yes! Gunshots are very loud. Genius. Anyway, I did a book report on it for a, a class called Bizarre Archaeology about frauds and stuff. And it was very funny. Even showed a picture of, like, squirrels fighting with lightsabers because Star Wars. So anyway, that's the top piece. Here's the bottom piece, or the side piece, whatever. There, there's a whole floor of these things. Here's a side piece, and on top of that will be a removable lid. The lid consists of these, which will need to be stuck together. They go like this. And see, they sit up top with this here. So, when this is off, I only have to reach down this much of a furnace. When this is on, I have this much more furnace height. Pretty neat, huh? And this is going to be really heavy with nine of these to lift off, but I'll live. Or you'll get to see me, uh, you know, be weak and whatever on camera, which will be fun too. Now, the amount that I'm going to cut this off is actually marked on this template already. So anyway, the author of that book, as you might have guessed, he had a PhD in not Egyptology, totally unrelated, and it was from an unaccredited university. So yeah, he didn't really have a PhD in anything then. But check it out. With that tip cut off, this will stand, which means you get nine of them around. They don't even need each other to lean on. The point is, these pieces, all the side pieces, they're obviously going to stand up. The top pieces, independent of one another, they'll stand up too. There's no mortar holding this together. So without anything attaching them, the bricks will stand on their own. So anything I add to this will strengthen it. Now I just got to do this eight more times each. Fortunately, I don't have to make a million more of these because I already did it. This is the bottom part. This is the lid. Lid's upside down, so it's going to be sitting the other way. I'm going to cut these off. Then I'll have kind of a cylinder and a sort of cylinder top. 
I might shave some of this a little bit better to lighten it up. Because, like I said, light fire brick does not mean light. It means light for a brick. It's like light for a sledgehammer. You still don't want to get hit in the face by it. Also, I keep mentioning refractory in a coating, and I'm not putting it on or showing you the coating. I ordered it from a different place. It didn't come in at the same time. So, yeah, next time we'll do the coating. So, marking, 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 sawing, sawing. So, you see it doesn't stick out. I don't have a case to put this in. A lot of people build them inside a keg. Problem with that is you're limited by what size the keg is. I am not limited by what size the keg is. I have a big old sheet of sheet metal behind me and a bunch of sheet metal tools. So we're gonna, we're gonna get to that later, but we gotta mortar it up first. But this is the biggest step. Cutting all these bricks, it literally took all day. Also, I have five more bricks and a bunch of offcuts. If you got any good ideas for things I can do with these, let me know. There are a couple of small forges you can make with a few bricks. I didn't know I'd have five of them left over. But yeah, post your ideas down below. I mean, I bought like five extra that I didn't need. That's some amount of money I could have saved. <laughs>